I'm going to, to start today. Thank, uh, thanks to all of you for showing up for this. And uh, uh, I, I look forward to, to hearing questions from you. And uh, we'll be glad to try to answer questions as they, as they come along, both uh, during the talk as well as afterwards. So, so I want to start today with, with a historical event. And, and I'm going to pose a question to all of you. And this is a question that's relevant whenever we consider chemicals in the environment. And so this is a, a picture, uh, a painting of the assassination of Julius Caesar by the Roman Senate about 2000 years ago. And so my, the question I'm going to pose to you is that to consider in your next breath that you inhale, how many molecules of nitrogen will you inhale that were exhaled in the last breath of Julius Caesar as depicted here? Well, this last breath contained about 10 to the 22nd molecules of air, most of which were nitrogen. And of course, nitrogen is a very stable molecule. It moves quickly through the atmosphere. And within a few months, all of the nitrogen molecules from Caesar's last breath were rather evenly distributed throughout the atmosphere. And so that's, it's had plenty of time to mix well. Nitrogen is very slow to react. And the average nitrogen molecule persists in the atmosphere for at least a million years. So how many molecules in Caesar's last breath will be in your next breath? Well, we can, without with sparing you from doing the math, imagine there's a nitrogen molecule that gets in, inhaled and exhaled then in Caesar's last breath. And if we calculate how much air is in the, the, the Earth's atmosphere, we come to a calculation that in your next breath, roughly one molecule that you inhale will have been in Caesar's last breath. Now, the reason I raise this topic is to make the following points about persistence of molecules in the environment. And that's that when we release inert molecules into our environment, and they distribute themselves around the world as fast as air and water will move them. And then inert molecules spread around the world, certainly over our lifetimes, and eventually they spread out and are everywhere. And so that the story of PFAS has a lot to do with with molecules persisting in the environment. Okay, so, so molecules do move quickly within a few years around the environment if, if they're gases and or if they're soluble in water, you know, the streams take them to the oceans and the ocean currents mix them around unless the molecules are broken down into other substances, in which case they may be chemically transformed into something and they no longer represent what they were initially or if they stick to something and they partition into stationary materials such as soil or living things, and that includes us. And so once the stable molecules, the things that persist in the environment and eventually reach us may actually be concentrated in our tissues. They may have more of an affinity for us and our tissues and our blood and, and, uh, and organs than they do for, for water and air and the like. And in that case, sometimes they will be concentrated in our tissues and will be, we will be more contaminated than the environment around us. So that's sort of a bioconcentration effect. Okay. So an important part of today's story begins with recognizing the unique properties of the element fluorine. Fluorine doesn't appear in nature in its elemental form, which is difluorine, because it reacts with almost everything. But rather, we'll find fluorine in, the, in nature as fluoride, the, say, the negatively charged ion, which is the form present in many toothpastes. Fluoride forms strong bonds with the calcium ions in tooth enamel, and that makes it more difficult for the enamel to dissolve. And that you know, prevents cavities. So that's why we add it to toothpaste. And this strong bonding in fluoride, fluoride or in fluorine eventually, is driven in part by its small size. So I'm going to to bring in and highlight where fluorine is in the periodic table here. So this little circle that you see um, highlights fluoride, fluorine. And these circles largely depict the atomic radii. So what I want you to see in this is that fluorine is a very small atom, smaller than almost anything else same, and think comparable to hydrogen. And when, it's, when you have a small atom, it forms short bonds, which are often very strong. Um, and so this strong bonding is driven by both the size and the attraction that, of the positively charged fluorine nucleus for negatively charged electrons. In the case of a carbon fluorine bond, this is one of the strongest, it's certainly the strongest single bond that you almost ever encounter. And, uh, and so this means that element, I mean, this forms such a strong bond that elemental fluorine can even react with diamond and form carbon fluorine bonds. 
and so that molecules that have multiple fluorine bonds have lots of strong bonds and they therefore last for a long time. And we, the, the pharmaceutical industry attaches fluorine into drug molecules to try to slow down how fast they're bro broken down. And so that allows them to, to last longer. You don't have to take a medication quite as frequently if it's been fluorinated because that usually slows down the process. And so for these reasons and, and several others, fluorine is the only element to have actually had its own division. There is a division of fluorine chemistry within the American Chemical Society uh, to highlight that fluorine is, has unique chemistry and unique properties. And this leads us to today's topic, which are the compounds called PFAS. Now, most of us are familiar with, with uh, fluorinated compounds, if you know the material Teflon or, or polytetrafluoroethylene, a nonstick coating which is used on frying pans and, and other substances. Teflon is a large solid molecule that's not easily applied to surfaces, but its properties inspired the development, <coughs> excuse me, uh, of other soluble forms. And, and some of these are shown here. And so PFAS is an acronym that stands for per and polyfluoroaliphatic substances. So per and polyfluoroaliphatic substances or, or PFAS. So perfluorinated means that that there are no hydrogens attached to carbons in the molecule. So these molecules called PFOA and PFOS, there are no hydrogens. There are polyfluorinated, which have lots of fluorines as well, but they have some hydrogens on carbon. This makes them somewhat reactive so that these can break down, but when they break down, they largely break down into perfluorinated compounds, which last a long time because they're very stable. These are interesting compounds because they repel both oil and water. <laughs> so they've made for sort of stain resistant and water repellent coatings, but they're also fantastic lubricants and they function over a wide range of temperatures. And you know, to, to, to make our lives complex, there are more than 4,700 documented different chemical substances that fall into the PFAS category. And, uh, and so we, we don't, measure all of these. In, in fact, I, I'm sure there are far more PFAS chemicals that are, are in use than the ones that are documented, but these are the ones that, that, that companies have gone through the, the effort to, to, to characterize. Uh, one other thing I'd want to mention is that the, the chemistry of PFAS substances is frequently changing as new discoveries are made and new regulations are applied. And manufacturers, for the most part, are not required to disclose the details about product chemistry. So they can make something and say, oh, it's, it's a polyfluorinated uh, phosphate. And you'll never really know what exactly the chemistry of this is because they're not required to disclose this. OK. So there's sort of a, a repeated environmental tragedy in, in the, the context of consumer products. And we've seen this with with uh, CFC aerosols many years ago. And that's that we as consumers really want products that last a long time. We don't have to want to replace things all of the moment. We'd like substances that are not irritants and not that we'd like things that are not likely to catch fire when during storage or use. And as I mentioned earlier, the carbon fluorine bond is one of the strongest. And because it's such a strong bond, PFAS chemicals are not flammable. They don't burn and they satisfy many of our demands as consumers. Okay, what has become obvious over the years though is that because they're resistant to oxidation, bacteria, which usually break down substances that are released to the environment, don't do a great job of oxidizing them to carbon dioxide and fluoride, which we consider to be relatively harmless products. So in essence, the, 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 the panel I was on, I was on the Michigan uh, PFAS advisory response team uh, advisory panel two years ago. And one of the comments that we made in our report was this segment in the middle here, that, that there are no known natural environmental processes in water and soil, at least, that can completely destroy perfluorinated chemicals. They might be destroyed if they get into the atmosphere and, and ultraviolet light from the sun can break them down. But if they're in water and soil, they're, they're, if they're perfluorinated, chances are they're always going to be there and they're, they're just not going to go away. Okay, so 
for this reason, we've, these PFAS chemicals have been given the designation as forever chemicals. They just move, they don't ever go turn into to other things. They largely just move from one place to another. Okay, so where are PFAS? Well, I mean, most of our focus for the last few years has been that they're in drinking water. <laughs> but PFAS chemicals are not just in drinking water, but they're really in a wide range of consumer products. And you may be familiar with Scotchgard fabric protector or stain master carpets and uh, the upholstery, the things that are, are stain resistant. And, but there's also the household dust that as these carpets break down into small pieces, uh, that the PFAS chemicals that are on their surfaces go along with the dust as well. PFAS are coatings for Hush Puppy shoes and other brands, uh, but many are unaware that PFAS chemicals are also in food packaging, such as microwave popcorn. I mean, remember PFAS chemicals by and large are oil and water repellents. So they're, they're great for something like a microwave popcorn container that has oil that gets heated up. The PFAS compounds uh, largely pre prevent it from leaking out. And the same is true for for wrappers of, of different food types, of whether it's sandwiches, uh, pat bags of french fries. It, it used to be that PFAS were in pizza boxes, but I don't think that that's true so much anymore. They also show up in things like Post-its and Sharpies. And, uh, and, but, and we, many of us are sort of aware of that, but almost every computer disk drive that's in a computer has a PFAS lubricant because they're fantastic lubricants. When you dispose of, of your disk drive, those PFAS eventually are going to leak into the environment. We have Gore-Tex uh, textiles. Um, there are also industrial purposes, such as you know, when you do chrome plating, you know, the electrolysis that happens during chrome plating leave, leads to lots of bubbles. If you want to suppress the bubbles and the transport of of carcinogenic chromium-6 into the air, you can add PFAS chemicals and that suppresses it. So you, you solve one problem, but you then create another one by having lots of material that needs to be disposed of. What many aren't aware of is that PFAS are included in things like dental floss. There are some PFAS in certain fluorinated fishing lines. One of the more important occupational exposures to PFAS is from professional skiers because the waxes that we now use in, in high performance skiing are, are, are almost always have PFAS chemicals in them. And then PFAS are included in a wide range of cosmetics because they go on and they come off and they, they, they protect from moisture and uh, they're, they're sort of moisturizing ingredients. So, so these are compounds that are, are slightly soluble in water they're transported through groundwater and surface water once they get into the environment. They're often enriched at water air or solid air interfaces. So you might see foam in, on the, the surface of a lake. And ultimately these compounds, because they're not transformed into anything else, get absorbed and taken up by plants and animals and in particular fish. So Dan, we actually had a question sent in that um, is asking about cooking pans and the non-stick pans. Um, and if you know of any non-PFAS types that work well and they last. And then I will also say we have had a couple requests. Your camera is off. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but if you don't mind. If it wasn't not, intended. Put no. a face to the voice. If not, that's let, okay. I don't want to put okay, you on the spot. Let me stop sharing for a moment. Sure, you know what? I'll, turn, I'll turn your camera on and you can answer the question. How about that? Okay, certainly. Am I showing up now? Okay, but here we go. Had a request come through. I, yes. There you go. We can see you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure how that got switched off. But, um, so, so first question about the different kinds of nonstick pans. There are a variety of, of nonstick. I mean, I think ceramic-based pans that are. To be honest, many of these are proprietary, so you don't know what you're getting when you purchase something. Now, now what you'll often find sometimes is that products will say that it does not contain PFOS, P-F-O-S, and not P-F-A-S. So that means it doesn't contain a specific type of PFAS chemical, but that doesn't mean it does not contain any PFAS chemicals. So, I mean, one of the, the challenges we have is that we, it's hard to find out what's in the consumer products and the manufacturers 
by and large, you know, won't tell us unless they're sort of embarrassed by environmental activists who go out and actually do the analysis for us. And then the second question was? Um, it was, I think it was just, um, if you had any recommendations for any non PFAS types of cooking ware. I do not specifically, uh, but what, what I'm going to hope to show you is that, is that I think for most of us, the majority of our exposure to PFAS chemicals does not come from our frying pans, that it's in almost everything else. So if you're using certain brands of, you know, of dental floss, probably, you are more likely to be exposed from that than you are from your frying pan. That there is some release from frying pans, but the amounts are, are small compared to, to what's in everything else that's around us. That sound good? Okay. And you know, excuse me, we have one more that came in in relation to different materials. Um, and it is, were PFAS ever used in children's pajamas for flame proofing? I don't believe it's used in pajamas, but anything that is sort of Gore-Tex or sort of waterproofed, uh, I, I, it, it may very well have this, but, but I think for most children, their, their exposure is probably more likely to be sort of as the, this slide shows is that their contact not so much their contact with carpet, but you know, small children don't just make contact with carpet, but then they stick their hands in their mouths. And so they're, they're more likely to, they're less likely to absorb this through the skin, but they are, than they are to ingest it. But, but there's lots of other PFAS sources. And we, to be honest, we don't know a lot about the relative amounts of how much comes from carpet versus food versus cooking materials versus food packaging, for example. We really, I mean, we're really just beginning to explore most of those questions. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, so, so since natural processes don't really destroy PFAS, they really just move from place to place. And so, so you know, we recently visited a landfield uh, out in Richfield Township where PFAS containing wastes were once dumped and water from rainfall now leaches the chemicals out of the landfill. And this water is now collected into the large storage tanks that you see here. And the, you can, the, the ladder gives you a sense of the size of these, these tanks. Now, several times a week, a truck comes to collect the water, which is then transported to the Genesee County Wastewater Treatment Plant. However, unlike a lot of other chemicals, the, rate, the treatment plant doesn't destroy the PFAS. Uh, most of which just settles into biosolids that are then used as fertilizers and applied to agricultural crops. And some people use this in fertilizing their gardens. So the take home message here is that PFAS chemicals by and large don't go away. Uh, we, we, don't, we can pump them out and, and, and collect them, but we don't have attractive ways to right now to destroy them. And so there's a complex movement of PFAS chemicals. So in this case, you might have the production, just sort of industrial production of these chemicals. Some of this ends up in landfills. The landfills, then the water leaches out. We collect the water, it goes into wastewater treatment plants. And from here, it becomes biosolids, but then that becomes agricultural soil. And some of that gets taken up into our food and crops. Uh, I mean, livestock as well as, as, as plant crops. Some of it may leach out of the soil and end up in the surface water and may end up as our drinking water. So we've got consumer products, we've got crops, we've got indoor dust. Uh, all of these contribute to our human exposures. And for the most part, we don't have good ways of, of quantifying how much is here. I mean, there are some modeling that's been done. There, there's, there's, there's some estimates that all of these contribute, but for a single individual, how much you get depends upon what consumer product you buy, what kinds of food you, buy, you, you consume, and where you get your drinking water from. Okay, so I'm going to, to backtrack here for a moment and step back in history to the year 2001. And I wanted to, to highlight this because it, 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 it gives us an, an indication that, that Michigan State University has been contributing to the PFAS discussion for a good long time. So our former colleague, John Giese, 
um, published this paper in 2001 where they collected wildlife samples from all over the world. And so this is nearly 20 years ago and they analyzed PFAS chemicals. And this is just a limited range of PFAS chemicals in whitefish and in brown trout, in herring gulls, uh, the plasma and in frogs. And these are all sort of not part per trillion levels, which we talk about sometimes in the context of our drinking water, but these are part per billion levels. So, so a thousand times more abundant. Uh, so high levels of PFAS being found. But what's sort of interesting here is that the distribution between the eggs, liver, and muscle in whitefish is really quite different than it is for brown trout. And we still don't understand why this is. Now, you know, whitefish and trout have very different diets, but we don't know why once it's in them, why it distributes itself differently into different tissues. And so there's lots that we'd like to understand in terms of, of just the transport. Where did PFAS chemicals go? And this was one of the, the, the key studies that, that got people thinking about where do PFAS chemicals go? And, and part of the, the things that it led to was the discovery that even polar bears in the, the northern the Arctic regions that are far from, from chemical manufacturers have really high levels of PFAS in their livers. And that, that those levels were growing exponentially up until about 2000. Uh, so, so these are chemicals that, that not just get into the environment and last a long time, but they go everywhere. So they're, they're all over the world now. Okay, so let's put this in, in the perspective of, of where the timeline for these perfluorinated chemicals. So Teflon or PTFE was invented in 1938, sort of accidentally discovered it at the DuPont Corporation. By the 1940s, these were in initial production of nonstick coatings. And in the 50s, we had water resistant coatings and eventually firefighting foams. Eventually, the, uh, the inert properties were recognized you know, to, to put out fires. And so the military and airport firefighting drills use PFAS uh, as experiments. Uh, and newer kinds of PFAS chemistries continue to develop. But by the year 2000, it was becoming apparent that PFAS chemicals were in blood samples from nearly all human subjects that were, that were monitored and were also showing up in wildlife. And there was some initial toxicity testing that suggested a variety of adverse health effects might be responsible. So but by the beginning of the 21st centuries, the US manufacturers at least agreed to cease manufacture of what we call the, the longer chain PFAS chemicals called PFOS or PFOA and a few others um, and have sub substituted these. They've changed their formulation so you can still get Scotchgard but it's made from a PFAS mixture that is considered less toxic than it used to be. This doesn't mean that the PFAS chemicals are no longer made. Uh, these, are, these agreements were US producers only. So other countries still produce some of these compounds and we have global uh, supply chains that, uh, that more or less ensure that these chemicals haven't gone away completely. Now, there are, over time we've, we've had time to to evaluate their toxicity, both in animal model systems, but also using epidemiology in human subjects. And so there are several health effects that have sort of stand out as being probably the things that, that we consider the, the most relevant issues with, with PFAS. And perhaps you know, the timely issue is that uh, individuals with higher PFAS exposures have generally shown reduced responses to vaccines. Uh, so in the context of COVID vaccines, or how, how well are vaccines going to work if you're, all, if you're consuming more PFAS chemicals, there's probably a, a reasonable chance that, that your response to that vaccine is not going to be as strong as it would be in someone who's not exposed so much. This also leads to a, <clears throat> it's, uh, some differences in resistances to infectious diseases. So again, in the COVID-19 context, uh, PFAS, we don't really have strong quantitative predictions for how large an effect this is going to be, but it's certainly a factor that, that may be relevant. There are also epidemiological studies in humans that suggest that there are increased autoimmune disorders. Uh, this could include uh, rheumatoid arthritis, as well as lupus has been associated 
there's some evidence that you know, PFAS exposures are related to thyroid diseases, higher incidences of certain kinds of cancers, and decreased birth weights in newborns. So it raises the, the question, well, what levels are safe? And, and most of our focus um, has been on drinking water because it's more easily monitored and regulated. So in last year, the Michigan uh, MPART group uh, proposed and adopted new health-based maximum contaminant levels for a variety of different PFAS chemicals. So, so I mentioned earlier that there are, there are roughly 4,700, any, anywhere upward of that in terms of how many PFAS chemicals are, are around. Um, the, um, here, the, the group decided that, that they thought that they could reliably you know, conclude that there were seven compounds that they felt comfortable with proposing standards. So, so their recommendation was that these should be the maximum contaminant levels for consumption in drinking water. So the, the, several of these, the, the PFNA, which has nine carbons in it, so it's a longer chain. These are, tend to be you know, more long lasting and more toxic. At six parts per trillion, they considered that that, that was an action level that uh, should guide, you know, adding, you know, remediation or removal from drinking waters or changing the drinking water supply. PFOA, eight parts per trillion, PFOS, 16. Uh, and, and some others, of course, you know, there are other PFAS chemicals that the, the evidence is not as strong. And so the, the recommended levels for action are, are much higher. Right now, there's a federal advisory that recommends sort of 70 parts per trillion of PFO and PFOS combined, but there really is, so far, there's no regulatory action at the federal level. These are advisory levels. Uh, the state of Michigan is working towards legislation and action that might implement actions to, to try to ensure that, that when these values are exceeded, that the that either people will get you know, filtration units or something to, to help purify their water. So in terms of, of what are the risks, they're, they're chemical dependent. Not all PFAS chemicals have the same toxicity and not all of them have the you know, persistent and, and cause problems that are going to, to trigger regulatory uh, actions uh, down the road. So why are there are such differences in PFAS chemicals. Well, the longer the chain, the more the number of carbon atoms that are in the molecule, the longer they stay in our system. So, so these PFAS are, I mean, the more persistent they are, not just in the environment, but in us, the more likely they are to bioaccumulate in us. So I'll use PFOS here as one example that the estimated half-life. So if, in essence, this is, if you were to have a drink of water that had PFOS in it today, that it would take roughly five years before half of those molecules were excreted from your system. The rest of the time, they stick to our tissues and stay with us for a good long time. Now, if you're drinking the even part per trillion levels for, for several years, five years means 1,800 days. So we, we have another drink and we add more in and we add more in. And so before long, we become about a thousand times more contaminated with PFOS, with the compounds that have long half-lives than is in the water we drink. And so if these are toxic in parts per trillion concentrations in water, it's because they're accumulating and spending more time in our tissues. Okay, so why, how exposed are, are human populations in general to PFAS chemicals? There are only a few compounds that have been measured in human blood specimens. And this graph here suggests that human exposures can really be organized into three groups. And, and for those who are paying attention to, on the y-axis here, this is, in, this is one particular PFAS chemical called PFOA. It's in micrograms per liter, which is parts per billion. And notice that this is a logarithmic scale here. So we're changing by factors of 10. So there are the groups of people who, and these are the, the levels that are in their blood serum. So this group of people, these are the people who are often working in you know, chrome plating or PFAS manufacture. These are occupationally exposed. Uh, 
And so the levels are really quite high. We're, you remember, we're, we were just talking about you know, six parts per trillion. This is now, I mean, six, say 6,000 parts per billion. So six parts per million in, in the occupationally exposed individuals. There are those who live in contaminated water areas where they're what we call a point source exposure. So, so their levels are, are still pretty high for the most part. And then there's everyone else. And, and I've sort of drawn this baseline here. This is about you know, five or six you know, parts per, per billion here. And what you see is that regardless of where you, where you go in the world, whether you're in the USA, in Michigan, Seattle, uh, Colombia, Japan, South Asia, it, uh, Europe, almost everyone, the, the majority of people have all have in their, their blood about five or six parts per billion of PFOA. So if I back up for a moment to PFOA, the recommended maximum contaminant level in water is parts per trillion. So eight parts per trillion, we're talking here about roughly six parts per billion. So in essence, all of us, except for this one you know, isolated population in Peru, are about a thousand times more contaminated than the water that we care about. So that, 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 that we are more, more polluted. So the, the question has often come up, is it safe for me to swim in the, the stream if it's got part per trillion levels of, 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 of PFAS in it? Well, when, when all of us are, at part, are more contaminated than that by a thousand fold, it's not clear whether we release PFAS into the water or whether we're still taking it up. I mean, it may be a, a bit of both. Okay, so, so I wanted to pose, sort of identify what, what, what we think are some of the grand challenges and questions regarding PFAS and PFAS contamination, because there are many different aspects of PFAS contamination that, uh, <clears throat> that we, we just still do not understand, and there's, there's need for much research. Uh, we, as I've just mentioned, we don't know much about the roots of exposure for most people. And so does it make sense to invest in water purification systems uh, that can be expensive if most of our exposure is coming through our food supply or from consumer products? We, we just don't know. So we need to do more biomonitoring to find out which PFAS chemicals are in humans, in human populations, and as well as what's in their homes, what's in their food systems. So, so that's part of what uh, our, our proposed center is, you know, aims to do is to be monitoring more of what's in the food supply, what are in consumer products, and how do we relate exposures uh, to, 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 to risk ultimately. <laughs> the uh, most measurements only measure a very small number up until recently, only about 14 to 24 different PFAS chemicals uh, when there are thousands that are out there. So how do we arrest, address the risks when the, the range of PFAS chemicals is much more diverse than what we measure and it's constantly evolving and changing. And then at the bottom here, what are the suitable replacements? What, what are essential you know, functions that we need PFAS for? And what are, you know, what aspects where PFAS are used now could easily be, sub, you know, we could use substitutes with that are, are safer for us, that are you know, better, beneficial for the environment and, uh, and still accomplish what, uh, what we need them to do. So, so one of our current limitations lies in having the tools to measure PFAS chemicals. <clears throat> so the current technologies until recently have been rather limited, but they've become more sensitive. I mean, the, uh, the instrument manufacturers have, have really improved their technologies but there really is only one technology that is useful for measuring PFAS chemicals down at the part per trillion levels, and that is liquid chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry. And interestingly enough, this the tandem mass spectrometer, the, the triple quadrupole or tandem quadrupole system that I've illustrated here, was invented in the 1970s here at MSU by Chris Enke and his graduate student, Rick Yost. And this is still the technology that is used by most laboratories that are measuring PFAS chemicals today. <laughs> now there's a need for more, for more advances in these technologies, uh, in part because we'd like to have 
I mean, the costs of these instruments are high and turnaround of, of the, the, the demand is, is also high. So turnaround is slower than we'd like. And the labor force is, uh, that has appropriate skills to do these kinds of analyses is limited and in very high demand. Uh, so there's a need for more sensitive and rapid methods for measuring a more complete range of PFAS chemicals in water, soils, foods, and consumer products. And some legislation has been proposed that says that we should not even bother trying to measure individual compounds, but we should just measure the amount of total organic fluorine in soils and water and the like, and use these measurements to regulate uh, water quality or, or food quality. Now, it's challenging to achieve such measurements with current technologies, although this is a very attractive area for research. But perhaps more importantly, there are many organic fluorine compounds that are not considered to be PFAS chemicals. And I've illustrated several of these here. In fact, roughly one third of, of the blockbuster prescription drugs are fluorine containing molecules, including medicines to treat asthma, such as Flovent, depression, uh, Genuvia treats diabetes, uh, Atorvastatin for high cholesterol and levofloxacin. All of these are fluorine containing molecules. So. If, if you, we were just to measure organic fluorine, and a lot of these compounds are excreted and go through the wastewater system, and they're in our waterways and the like, that we might be trying to regulate. Uh, if we're just measuring total organic fluorine, we might end up regulating based on drug metabolites more than we are you know, PFAS chemicals that are potentially harmful for us. So, so how do we remove PFAS? Uh, the current technologies, at least for drinking water, largely involve either reverse osmosis units or granular activated carbon filtering or some sort of ion exchange resins similar to, to, to water softening resins. So you can pass water through all of this and either the, the PFAS chemicals get retained as they do on this activated carbon system here or in a reverse osmosis, they end up in a waste stream that then just gets discharged back into the sewage system. This doesn't destroy the PFAS, and, we, and different chemicals will break through these at different rates. So we don't always know how long you can operate a system such as this uh, before it, chemicals break through. And if you have reverse osmosis, which works very well, you still end up, you're not destroying the chemicals, you're just you know, concentrating them in your, in your sewage waste so that uh, they, they go downstream and end up in wastewater treatment. But, but again, as I mentioned earlier, that doesn't break them down. So. If you want to break down PFAS chemicals, <clears throat> the most effective way to do this is to go to very high temperature incineration. You have to get up above about 1500 degrees Celsius to do this. There's not a single incinerator in the state of Michigan that, that accomplishes this. So, so it means you have to ship you know, your wastewater to elsewhere if you want and, and waste products if you need to destroy them. So. There are high energy oxidations and reductions that, that potentially can break these down, but most of them have yet to be proven that they're economical beyond sort of the lab bench scale. So there's some, some potential there, but, but still a lot of research that needs to be done. So Dan, we did have a question come in and it says, you mentioned UV break, breakdown in the atmosphere. Could UV water treatment also work? UV water treatment could potentially work, but you know, the, it depends if you're dealing with drinking water, it might, but, but UV, by it, whoops, UV by itself doesn't do a great job of breaking these things down. Uh, it has a tendency to break down almost everything else. And so there, there, are, there are downsides. I mean, yes, there, there are things that we can do, for example, to, to break down. So, so with the right UV and with the right you know, systems, you can break them down, but, but usually UV and oxygen will break them down only down to a certain level. And then you still have PFAS chemicals regardless. Now, to get them to break down further, you need to put in a lot of energy. So that means either much higher temperatures or you need to have very high energy oxidants. But, but even, I mean, ozone, many of the other oxidants that people have tried, don't break them down beyond, all the way to, to carbon dioxide. Uh, so so there's, there's still a need to, to improve these. There are some experimental oxidative techniques that, that have accomplished this, and there's some things that, that use uh, hydrated electrons that, that you know, break them down too. But the oxidative techniques have a downside is that if there's salt in your 
water that you en may end up turning it into perchlorate, which is a thyroid toxin. So you know, it's not, we're not only concerned with breaking down the PFAS, we want to make sure that we're not creating something that's even worse in the process. Great, thank you. Okay, so what we've been aiming to do here at Michigan State, and we've been focused on this for the last year or so, is that uh, the, the challenges of, of, that are presented by PFAS contamination really require that we bring together teams of researchers that can contribute expertise in varied areas and are willing to work together as problem solvers. So, so Cheryl Murphy, who's in the, the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, is now the director of this new PFAS Center, which has just been launched this year. <clears throat> and it includes researchers from multiple MSU colleges, including Angel my colleague Angela Wilson here from, from Natural Sciences. Uh, <clears throat> we're organizing around really six sort of themes. One is measuring and modeling health impacts in humans and wildlife. Second would be assessing exposures and biomonitoring of populations and prediction of biological activities uh, with a fairly you know, heavy emphasis on computational tools. <clears throat> Third is to assess PFAS fate and transport into the food supply and guiding best practices in terms of things like how much, you know, can we use biosolids from wastewater treatment as fertilizers. Uh, fourth is identifying the risks and communicating them with the public. <clears throat> So we have uh, Lois Wolfson from you know, University Extension, Jade Mitchell, um, and you know, Mark Axelrod. We've got a variety of, of people here who are, who are organizing, integrating the, uh, the public in the decision-making and then sort of the, the planning processes uh, for research and communicating what the risks are and what activities uh, influence those risks. And then we have a, a, another group of, of faculty who are involved in sort of risk management, which often means remediation, to developing new technologies to break down PFAS and to organize them uh, and to organize the development of alternatives that, that are, have superior properties and superior, uh, not just performance properties, but su superior environmental risks uh, to exposures, uh, not just to humans, but to wildlife as well. So the center has begun, I mean, several of us, uh, most notably John Wise, Hui Li, uh, Wang Zhang, uh, myself and a few others are involved in trying to, to help guide the development of a world-class analytical facility that can provide measurements and support for these compounds, as well as other related efforts through compound measurement, as well as compound discovery. Uh, the center is beginning to explore partnerships with an assortment of companies and foundations to help launch these efforts and to raise funds for this. But our, our efforts have just begun, and we certainly invite participation by the community as we move this forward. So I want to finish by going back to the painting of, of, of the, the dying breath of Caesar. So Caesar's last breath released about 10 to the 22nd molecules into the atmosphere. And during this presentation, each of you have taken in more than 400 molecules of nitrogen from Caesar's dying breath. Fortunately, these molecules don't stick to you. And you have exhaled them and released them back to the atmosphere as well. By comparison, during the, the decades of production of, of PFOS, <clears throat> instead of 10 to the 22nd molecules, PFOS was produced at roughly 10 to the 32nd molecules. So this was a large scale industrial chemical you know, production material. So this is 10 billion times as many molecules as were released in, in Caesar's last breath. <laughs> now, if we go back to the, the sort of the baseline, if you're baseline contaminated, the, the figure that I showed you earlier, uh, those, all of us, I mean, essentially everyone on the planet has PFAS in their measurable amounts of PFAS in their blood. And uh, PFAS is a very stable molecule. Nitrogen is a very stable molecule. So these are things that last for, for centuries in the environment. But unlike nitrogen, once you take PFAS into your system, half the molecules are going to stick to you for about five years. And some basic calculations suggest then that 
the average adult now, each of us are carrying about 10 to the 18th molecules of various PFAS chemicals in us already. And so this corresponds to about 10,000 PFAS molecules in the average human cell. Now they're not e all evenly distributed, but the, the important thing to can think about is that these molecules are going to be with us for a long time unless we find good paths forward. And perhaps ultimately, uh, as we focus on how do we alleviate, we're not going to, to, to remediate people by extracting the PFAS out of us individually, but maybe we can develop technologies that will remediate their adverse health effects on us. And so there are great opportunities for this center, I hope, to, to lead those kinds of efforts, to lead the technologies forward. And, uh, and we, we, we hope that, uh, that MSU will make uh, great, great strides and advances um, over the, the next few years. So I just want to thank my audience uh, for participating in this presentation, and I will be glad to answer any questions and let Corey uh, manage this discussion. So thank you very much for being here. Dan, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple questions waiting, and I also want to encourage others. We still have nine minutes. If anybody else is contemplating sending in a question, please do. I think you did cover um, these questions, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to maybe expand on them a little bit. Um, is there is this material a hazardous material, and are there any disposal regulations? That's a very good question. At the moment, there is none of the PFAS chemicals are considered by CERCLA, sort of the federal regulations, as hazardous materials, but legislation has been introduced into the Congress to make at least some of them fall under hazardous materials. Uh, that bill, I think, I think that bill may have passed the House, but I don't know that it's gone anywhere in the Senate. So we don't really know where that stands at the moment. Uh, but for the moment, no PFAS chemicals are considered hazardous materials. And so that you're legally allowed to, to dispose of your, your PFAS wastes in just the regular landfills. Uh, it's, it's not what, what I would like to say, but see, but the, there really are no good alternatives right now. They, we, we don't treat them as hazardous wastes at the moment. Great, thank you. And another question, which I believe you touched on a bit anyway um, already, but um, health pathway risk, ingestion, dermal, inhalation, and then they put in parentheses PM 2.5 question mark. Okay. Um, well, we, we don't know as much about this as we'd like to. Uh, there, there haven't been really systematic studies. We, we can analyze house dust and we can conclude that, that yes, there are PFAS chemicals in, in dust particles, including the PM 2.5. So if you inhale these, uh, they will get into your lungs. And once there, they will stay there for a good long time. Uh, but we really, I mean, the, the general consensus, I think, of the scientific community right now is that most PFAS that, that exposures are coming from ingestion. So ingestion of foods, ingestion of, of contaminated drinking water, um, or ingestion of the dust itself. So, so we don't think, and, and dermal exposures, the, there are some, some conflicting evidence, but the, the, I think the, the majority of evidence suggests that dermal exposure is not a serious problem. Uh, it, it's more likely that that you must ingest these. It just, you know, the PFAS chemicals by and large don't like oil, so they don't penetrate through your skin as well as, as more typical drugs do. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in is, is there any one group of health issues that seem to be prominent from PFAS exposure? Lung issues, immune disease issues, cancer, metabolic issues? Um, I guess from what I have been able to tell, I mean, there, there are lots of studies that are not really connected together as well as we'd like them to be. And, and in part, because we don't always know what the real exposures are, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to interpret. All of those issues are, are to a certain extent connected together. So, the, uh, so we know that PFAS chemicals, or at least some of them, uh, change meta metabolism. And so, and they change metabolism of fats. So, so there are, I mean, 
PFAS exposed individuals tend to have higher cholesterol. They're more likely to be diabetic. And, uh, and so there, there definitely are metabolic issues. There, the, the, I think the, what we're more concerned with by and large, because, because many of those issues, you know, those you know, conditions can be treated other ways. I think more of us are concerned with the effects on, on birth weight in newborns and in immunity and in immune systems. Uh, I think the sort of the, the, the challenges of the, the latest infectious diseases make us aware that, that we don't always have good model systems to try to model immune responses. And we have to wait for long-term exposures in human populations uh, to get a handle on when there's a change in immune response. Uh, so, so, so those would be the, the, the areas that, that personally I, I, I'm more interested in. The, I mean, my own research, I mean, I have an NIH grant right now where we're studying the, the concept that's called the exposome, trying to measure as many compounds that, that pregnant women are exposed to, and then to look at the effects on their offspring. And now you know, we're doing this in their grandchildren. <clears throat> and we can see some things that based on exposures 30 years ago, that there are allergy and asthma and immune system uh, responses that, that carry through for you know, at least a generation. And we're, we're just now trying to understand where, what the basis is for these, for these uh, exposures. What, what exposures are, are responsible and, and how do they how does this carry forward in a way that we can predict uh, outcomes? So this next question ties into that a little bit. So PFOSs are considered emerging contaminants, although we have been aware of them for a long time. What do you think the next big thing will be as far as can contaminants of concern for human health or the environment? Um, my own thought is that uh, I, I'm less concerned with, with, I mean, I think that there are environmental contaminants and pollutants and there are lots of things like disinfection byproducts that are, that are sort of, you know, there are always new compounds that are, are sort of emerging. But one of the things that we've seen in, in our research is that when we start measuring environmental contaminants in, in human blood and we compare them to to substances that are made by the bacteria that live in our gut, that the bacteria that live inside of us are probably much more involved in regulating uh, our health than most of the environmental contaminants. And that's not to say that environmental chemicals aren't an issue, but, but the environmental chemicals, I think, ultimately connect with the bacteria and they, they influence what bacteria live and how well they do. But ba the bacteria are, are constantly spewing out some really nasty substances and but they're they're very dynamic and so so we we need to understand much more uh, that that we are an ecosystem that we're not just individuals that we we all carry around an enormous uh, cohort of bacteria and microbes inside of us and that environment influences that and diet influences that and in many cases i think those are stronger influences than most of the environmental chemicals we see. So we, we, we shouldn't forget about that, that our behavior and our diet it has probably more of a, a stronger correlation with, with our disease patterns than the, the chemicals we're exposed to. All of us are exposed to these chemicals. Uh, we can't really distinguish those, but we don't all have the same diet. Wonderful, we'll do one more question and then we'll wrap up for the day. How do you prepare wildlife samples for LCMS analysis, and is this difficult? Uh, it can be very difficult. The, the biggest challenge we have is in collecting the samples themselves um, because you can't put them into any Teflon, anything that's ever seen Teflon tubing, but the, the advice and, and the Eagle, the, the Michigan State Agency gives advice where they've told us, don't wear like uh, waterproofed, uh, garments because they probably have Gore-Tex or some, some PFAS chemicals in them. Don't take Sharpies or Post-it notes with you because they're going to contaminate your system. So the, the biggest challenge we really have is, is in, is in you know, preserving the samples and not contaminating them. As far as the analysis go, then usually most, much, much of this will be 
we'll homogenize the tissue, we'll extract them into some sort of solvent. There may be some laboratory you know, procedures that we use to try to, to, to clean up or remove potential interferences. But then, I mean, those are, are, are not the difficult part. The, the, the challenging part is much more about how do we not contaminate them because almost everything we have in our labs now has you know, PFAS contaminants in them.